I'd like to greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, we want to thank God for every appointment he has given us on this day. And I can only pray that, uh, maybe praying in agreement with uh, the elder who was praying, that by now you have found one or two messages that speak to you. But if you haven't, I think we still have got two days to go. And so may God bless you with a message that will be more befitting to the situations that you might be facing. There are many things that bless people in church. Others, it's music. Others, it's sermons, um, and so on. Interestingly enough, as much as I am a preacher, um, sermons don't do much for me. It's the music. Um, I get all my... messages in the songs. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm a preacher. Uh, you know. So I want to continue with our Family Life series. Let me apologize also for not arriving on time. Uh, some of you may be aware I am deployed to ZANU and Triple C. I am the only one who is allowed to move <laughs> between both. Uh, I don't know who's Zanu, I don't know who's Triple C. Uh, I want to look at the topic of marriage, but I don't want to look at it in the context of um, who should you marry, why marry them, no. I want to look into two aspects. One, internal family culture. Two, in-law relationships. And to do that, go with me to the book of Genesis chapter 2. And I'll ask you to start reading with me from verse 15 of Genesis chapter 2. From verse 15. Are we there? Are we there? Okay. We are going to consider in particular from verse 15 and we will take it all the way to verse 20. And because it's been a long day and uh, people have had lunch, I am going to make us read so that you don't sleep on me. Are we together? There are many more verses coming, don't worry. By the time I'm done, everyone will have read so that we address the, uh, the sadza and position it properly. Okay? So I'm going to start with Genesis chapter 2 from verse 15 to 20. Um, so somewhere here, I'm going to need 15, 16 in, in this group here. And then I'll need 17 and 18 uh, to come somewhere here. And then I'm going to ask for 19 and 20 to come from somewhere there um, at the back. I don't know who it will be, but 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay? We may start. Any language is fine. It's about participation. Yes, we need 17 and 18 somewhere here.
Thank you. 1920 at the back. Thank you very much. There are three important uh, stages that I want us to go through when it comes to family life. And although, um, remember we dealt with communication, now we're on marriage, but although I'm on marriage, I'll also very much uh, be talking in the context of the whole family, such that um, even if one is not married, the principles are still applicable. Are we still together, church? All right. Um, so God... The first thing I need us to understand is, is this, that when God spoke these words, he spoke them at the time when there were no cultures in the planet. Are you with me? There are no Zulus, no Shonas, no Debeles, no Kosas, no Chinese, no Americans, no British, nothing. It's just one race, a human race. Are we still together, church? That's going to matter in the three stages that we are going to um, look into. Because we are discussing first and foremost the creation of an internal um, family culture in the marriage and the family um, as a whole. Now, why does this statement that I start with matter? It is because one always has to make up their mind as to what has the most superior authority in the quality of life you want to live. Are we still together? Hello? Are you with me? Do you need a break? Pella, when a church doesn't respond, you can only assume they are tired. So, as I'm asking, do you need a break? Okay. So, we are Christians. Understand that maybe personally that's not what you meant when you chose Jesus as Lord and Savior. But regrettably, that is what it should mean. When you say you are Christian, you mean the rule of scripture supersedes all things. Now, it's possible you did not mean that when you became a Christian. You just had come only for the salvation part. With regret, it comes as a package. Are we together? So if, if you got baptized and in your mind you were clear that I'll use my Christianity here, but when it comes to these issues, I'll sort it them out my own way. I can only blame the pastor who baptized you because clearly they sold you the wrong package. Okay? The package of a Christian is clear. God commands all aspects. Are we still together? Then the question is going to be, what about everything that is around us? The answer there is very simple. On condition that it agrees with God, it may be incorporated into our lives. Are we together? But where it contradicts the will of God, scripture will come out superior in the life of a Christian. We are together on this one. Not, not in the sense that you agree, but do you understand it? <laughs> of course, like I said, if you came here for something else, you may not agree. But I'm now telling you that that is how the package works. All right? And so that should help us then because one of the biggest challenges I find when it comes to our Christianity, particularly as a pastor, is dealing with someone who wants to shop for the values they like, where they like. So when they realize the Bible here says something they don't like, they then say to you, ah, pastor, we are Africans. Do you understand? It means the Bible has raised a standard they disagree with. So they now want to go shop where they know they might get what they want. Beloved, that is not how it works. 
If that's what they taught you, they sold you the wrong Christianity. When the Bible says whosoever is in Christ is a new creature, it means exactly that. Recreated entirely according to the teaching of the gospel. Are we together, church? So that, because a lot of times when I deal with family issues, my biggest challenge is that before I can even address the issues in the home, I come to realize they are feeding from the, the uh, they are feeding from different softwares about what to do. This is why we are not finding a solution. Because I am sitting here as a pastoral counselor saying this is what the creator of humanity wants. And you are sitting there saying, in the Shona culture, we do it like this. But I'm not here for your Shonaness on Debeledes. I am here for the word of God. Do you understand? And being Sean and Debele, Zulu, British, Chinese, it only is allowed entry if it is an application of what God has already decided. Is the church still with me? Right. Now, before all these cultures came, God made a statement. It is not good for a man to be alone. I shall create a helper for him. Done. Are you with me? I want you to pay attention with me. That not only here, but throughout the Bible, There is no single verse that prescribes what genders do in the home. I can give you a chance to find it. There are verses that speak about gender in the church. But there is no verse that describes gender roles in the home. The church has verses that tell us who can be an elder, who cannot, who can be a, 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 a pastor, who cannot. Are you with me? But we have no verses where God enters the home and prescribes what he must do and what she must do. They are not there. The only thing he told the couple, be fruitful, multiply, have dominion. That is the only instruction we have to the couple. Are you with me? We'll walk a journey with you. Let's, let's take it step by step. Yeah. That is important because not only then does God give us a sacred understanding of the home, but he gives us a word that must root the home. And that key word is suitability. So, If I marry Z, the question then from scripture's perspective is suitability. Are we suitable for one another? God's mandate to every couple is suitability. Be suitable for one another. Be suitable. Are you with me? Be what? But then he doesn't define it. He doesn't say, by suitability, I mean, go work, go cook. Yes. 
that content was filled by us. Are we together? And we, we built this content using two primary principles. Culture, clan. Culture and clan. So in other words, there are cultures. Uh, some are Shona, some are Zulus, some are Ndebele, some are this, some are that. Everyone has got a culture that they belong to. And cultures have ways in which they have decided they want the love relationship to be expressed in the home. Are we together? If I went to my culture, when I marry my wife, she takes my surname. Are you with me? There are cultures in West Africa where when you get married, it is the man who changes his surname. Are you with me? So the changing of surname by a wife is actually not some kind of the right way of doing it. Depends on the culture you were born in. Such that if, if you invited a couple, maybe from somewhere in West Africa, particularly Southern Nigeria, and it's a pastor, an Adventist pastor and his wife, and they come here and, and, and you are chatting with them and they tell you their surname. And, and maybe one of you asks, so ma'am, what was your surname before you married pastor? And she says, no, ask him. He had a surname before marrying me. Because in their culture, he changed his surname to hers. Am I making sense? So therefore, no one is superior. Cultures are making choices. Cultures are doing what? Making choices. Then secondly comes the clan issue. We are not only Zulus, we are Mazibugos. Mazibugos also have their own internal clan culture. All right? That when you marry into the Mazibugos, these are some of the things that you need um, to do. For example, in, 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 in South Africa, there is a clan called the Ngubanes. Okay? You will notice them because they are sons. The tip of this finger is cut off at birth. So by the time they grow, the tip is off. Okay? Don't have to pity them. They don't pity themselves. It's, it's, it's their culture. Now, the Ngubanes are also known for something very strange. If a woman gets pregnant and the child she's pregnant with is not a Ngubane, women have been known to enter the kraal and die. The Ngubanes don't do DNA. When you say you are pregnant, they say, go into the kraal. If you are clear that this child is from this family, they take out the cows. Huh? A kraal where you keep cows. What do you call it in? Isbaya. Gesizu as well, Isbaya. Isbaya in. But I don't know what you'd call in Shona. Yes. So they take out the cows and they send you in there. Why? Because in the Zulu culture, all the heads of the family are buried inside. Inside. All the heads. So if I were to die, I go in to join my father and my brothers. My wife will be outside. But all the heads are here. It is a very spiritualized space. So to make sure you are not making them raise what's not theirs, they say go into the kraal. Many a women have not returned. She, 
Are we still together? Am I losing you? So you see, it's not a Zulu culture. It's a Ngubane thing. Are we together? So every girl who marries a Ngubane, first thing you better make sure about is faithfulness. Because Ngubane ancestors don't play. I don't care whether you believe in them or not. The reality is for them, something happens in there. Where it comes from, it's not the topic for now. But the reality is a woman who enters the kraal and is pregnant and is not their son's child. You don't live alive. That's internal culture. Are you with me? Now, then there's the final one that we read from, the biblical culture. So now I want us to work between these three. But the first thing I need you to understand is that it has to flow from the right direction. Whatever is in your clan and tribal culture has to be subject to the biblical instruction. And for that, I'm not apologetic. If it falls outside the biblical expectations, the word of God is clear. It expects us to drop it. Are you with me? Now, the first biblical culture is very clear. The instructions are two. Or maybe one. The other is a statement. There's a statement, be suitable to each other. Then there's an instruction, be fruitful and multiply. Now, here is what I am saying we need to understand emphatically. It's that at no point has God ever come back to explain himself in detail. What did this mean? And by implication, therefore, there is an expectation from the kingdom of God of suitability in families. Families must be suitable for each other. But what that suitability means has to be a discussion that takes place between those who are members of that family. And if they are borrowing from their culture, no problem. On condition, what you are borrowing doesn't contradict God. Are we together, church? So, for example, there is no part of the Bible that says who must cook. There isn't. All the Bible wants is suitability. So what does that mean, practically speaking? It means that when you guys are in your house, if she's the cooker, let it be for the benefit of suitability. In other words, it must be deployed as a tool to strengthen the relationship. Because what the kingdom of God says, you owe each other suitability at all costs. So, if he cooks, it has nothing to do with whether Shona men cook or not. The question is, in this house, does it produce suitability? Because, elder innocent, when Jesus comes... You will not be judged by what the Shonas do on the Bellas do. You will be judged whether you were suitable to the woman he gave you. So, judgment is not for the Shonas on the Bellas. Judgment is for suitability. I'm very early for hands. <laughs> Give me time. Every family must hold this biblical standard and ask itself all the time, are we suitable to each other? Are we suitable for each other? That is the primary question that must be answered first. Because when God spoke, the shoulders were not there. So you can't hold God to something that wasn't there when he spoke. It is not superior to him. It, it was produced... A, four or five thousand years down the line after he spoke. But by saying so, we are not saying God has issues with our cultures. God has no problem with culture. Culture is beautiful. 
All he wants is for culture to be an implementing agent of his instruction. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when culture implements a fulfillment of his word, God is happy. Because what he wants is suitability in the home. That's all he wants. That's all he wants. The clan culture. God is neither here nor there about your clan. The question is, its values, will they deliver a happy home? In which the people in it, lovers and children are happy. Because all God wants at the end is to be delivered families that say, thank you for putting us together. It was a joy to be with each other. So as a Zulu man, I have to go into my culture carrying the word of God. And I have to say to my culture, what do you have in you that helps me fulfill this? Make sense? Because the instruction to be suitable to your wife came way before Zulus were organized. So what has been standing as God's expectation since the beginning of creation is suitability. And I'm saying to you, I like God for not describing it. Because he clearly says, I have created creatures with brains. Seated down together in love, they are going to come up with definitions that are good for them. Are we together? So God is saying, if I have given Elder David here enough brain to be a doctor, surely he can have enough brain to love her suitably. With you, there's always trouble. I knew you were going to say something. <laughs> so, and this goes both ways, eh? It goes both ways. It's not a one-way street. If for the husband to the wife, the wife to the husband, parents to the children, children to the, to the parents. The home must strive for suitability. I strive for suitability. Now, therefore, let's be clear. The culture has its place. Now, here's where the problem comes. When there is an application of culture or clanism that seeks to set aside God's instruction, then we are on a collision course with God. Are you with me? I'm going to show you. Let's, let's. Ephesians 6 from verse 22. Let's just walk this journey together. Ephesians 6 from verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Okay? There are some key important things there. Submit to who? Submit to who? Submit to who? Are, are we listening, ladies? Submit to who? That means... Not even the pastor is worthy of your respect when your husband is not getting it. You are applying it in the wrong place. You start with your husband. Not this thing of being forever forward in church when pastors must be taken care of. Eh? And your husband is somewhere at home fiddling around because his wife has to take care of the pastors. Amen. 
I went to a camp meeting in Zambia last year. The Zambians camp like you, but the difference is they've built units for the pastors, right? In the campsite. We are allocated our units. The following morning, I've bathed, I'm ready. There comes a part, this lady, knocks at the door, and she says to me, hello, Pastor, how are you? I said, I'm fine, thank you. And she says, Pastor, um, I am assigned to clean your room. Okay. Then I looked at her hand. She was wearing a ring. I said, sorry, ma'am, you cannot clean my room. And she says, why? I said, because you are somebody's wife. Somebody's wife cannot be in submission to me. My wife is not present. I'll clean for myself. You go to your husband. Because I am not allowed by scripture to receive services of a woman who is not my wife. She can't be submitting to me. So the elders, the elders sent her back. And she comes again. She says, Pastor, please let me clean. Because now it's creating noise for the elders. I said, go to your husband. I'm going to the elders. I said to them, two hands I have. They sweep. They mop. They wash a plate. In the absence of my wife, no one's wife will be in service to me. The local pastor came. <laughs> I'll get to that. Then the local pastor says, Pastor, it's our way of showing you respect. I said, Pastor, it is unscriptural for a married woman to submit to me. Must a married woman enter the bathroom to see my underwear that I've washed and hang? Somebody's wife? I said, God forbid. I'll take care of myself till I leave. Then they said, what about a younger girl? I responded, ministry, ministry is nothing without reputation. Today, you say you sent her to clean. Tomorrow, I'm accused of sleeping with her. Protect my ministry. Neither do I want your daughters cleaning for me. Two hands I have. Two feet I have. I will find my way through. Women, submit to your own. That I'm not saying a woman must then be disrespectful to other men out there. No, I am saying you can treat other men with the honor of being human beings. But the submission and reverence of a husband, you reserve for your husband. Because the text doesn't say women submit to men. It says to your own husband. I'm going to chase you out. Are we still moving together? Yeah. It's important. It's important that we do that. It's important that we do that. Okay? In my house, it's a different case. My wife is there. My sister-in-laws are there. They are cooking. We are all chatting. And my sister-in-law brings me a plate. It's within the economy of our family. Are you with me? That's a different case altogether. But for me, I'm very clear. 
I take care of myself when I'm traveling. Take care of myself. That's what I do. I know how to dress myself. I know how to clean my space. I don't want anyone's wife or daughter. Because both are traps. On the other, you dishonor another man. On another, you create vacancy for rumors. So I'm okay. If it's not a hotel that sends maids, well, I'm okay. I'll have to deal with it. Because I need to honor you. Sis Linda can't come and clean for me. I need to honor you. When I look at her, I must see you. And remember, if I make her to be in submission, I'm submitting you. And I cannot submit another man to my will. He can only submit to the will of God, not to mine. Uh. <laughs> For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. Now you see these lines. One must be careful of liking them. Wait for Paul to define what they mean. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, now listen very carefully. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Right. Why? Why is the wife supposed to submit to the husband? Because the husband represents Christ. Christ who did what? Who died and saved the body. So the body submits to the head because the head died for the salvation of the body. So whoever wants to be the head of a woman, the church, he must demonstrate willingness and ability to die for her as Christ died for the church. So a man who has no interest in becoming Christ-like cannot expect submission. Because it's there. Why must the body submit to Christ? There's a qualifier. He died for the body. So headship is earned. <laughs> My brother, it's not that it doesn't hurt me either. <laughs> but I would be a liar if I don't teach it as the scripture has written it. <laughs> headship is to mimic Christ. Wifery is to mimic the church. And the text explains why. As Christ died for the body, the husband dies for the, for the wife and becomes the savior. So in other words, what the text is saying is that a man has a duty not to allow harm to pass him enrich the wife just as Christ stood between sin and his church it is the duty of a man to stand between that broken thing that seeks to break his family it is not a headship of control it is a headship of service <laughs> all right So, simply put, ladies, submit to your husbands. Let's not even try and philosophize it. Just submit. And it's very simple. Men, be the head as Christ is the head. Let's not bicker about that issue. Okay? What must the church do? Submit to Christ. What must the head do? Be the savior of the body. There, that's it. Paul has laid it. We have it. I don't need to philosophize it. Okay? Then, as if Paul knew we would debate it, he starts putting practical definitions. 25. 
husbands. Now it's about us. Before, he was instructing them to submit. Now he is telling men. Now listen to this very interesting thing. Paul then tells us to love our wives. But he then, he then through the Spirit, tells us what, what love should mean. Are, are you with me? All right. Let's start reading together from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ has loved the church. Now listen. And gave himself for, for her. So we understand. He's re-emphasizing that context. Is that this headship is a headship that includes saving, that includes service. All right? That he might sanctify. Now listen to this. Because now we are going to count the things that Paul says symbolize a loving man as Christ is loving. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. One. Two. That he might present her to himself a glorious church. Three. Having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she should be holy and without blemish. That's four. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. Right? So now, let's ask Paul. Paul, how do I then fulfill this commandment? How do I love my wife, my sister, my mother, in a manner that fits this? Paul says, here are God's expectations. One, you will present your wife always sanctified. Two, cleansed. Three, you will present her like a glorious church. Four, there will be no spot, wrinkle, or blemish. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying, Are we together? Yes. Do I still have you? Yes. Paul is giving simple instructions. One, no wife should cry because of her husband. Amen. You cannot be the cause. You can't be. You are Christ. You are the wiper of tears, not the causer. I have lost you. I might as well, I might as well close and we go home. It's here in the text. Paul says, this is how Jesus will present the church to God. Therefore, you also, being mimickers of Christ, must present your wives in the same. And he gives us four categories. He says, number one, the church must always be sanctified. What is sanctification? A process of improving a sinner, isn't it? We deal with it a lot in church. Justification versus sanctification. Justification, you are saved through Jesus Christ. Sanctification, you are given victories over your old self daily by the Holy Spirit. Are right, together? So in other words, what is Paul saying? It is the duty of every husband to make sure by the time he leaves this world, his wife is in a better state than when he met her. Sanctify her. Sanctify her. She can't have met you with a high school qualification and you are on your way to the grave. She is still carrying the same qualification. Sanctify her. Improve her daily. Because one day you will have to present her to Christ sanctified. Just as he presents the church to God, sanctified. In other words, it means the church that God gave Jesus at Calvary will not be the same as the one he will fetch. It will be better. 
Because through the Spirit, he's been sanctifying it. So husbands, sanctify your wives. Two. He says, cleansed. Cleansed. Are we together? She must be what? Now cleansing is an admission that you were dirty before. Yeah? And he speaks in the context of sin, that our sins have been washed away. So what does that mean? It is your duty as a husband to wipe out all things from the past that have prevented your wife from being the best of who she can be. Cleanse. Deal with it. She comes from a poor family that denied her education. Cleanse her. Cleanse her from the past that denied her growth. Deal with it. Because you must present her to Christ. Sanctified and cleansed. Three. Three. He says, like the glorious church, beauty. A wife must always look beautiful. And he says, it is the duty of the man to oversee that. Uh, why? Why? Because men who are not investing in their wife's beauty are busy analyzing the beauty of other women. But if you are focused on your wife's beauty, you are producing what you want. Therefore, you have no interest in what others are doing. Beautiful, glorious church. <laughs> huh? <laughs> so, shh, shh, it's like I'm losing you again. <laughs> What, what, what Paul is addressing is this. God has given you the right to influence the beauty you want to see. So if you now see other women, God doesn't understand. What did you do with the privilege I gave you to influence beauty in your own wife? Why are you here? Because if there was something you wanted out of her, you should have worked with her and invested in producing it. What is it? What is it? You, you, you like her slimmer. It is your biblical right to go together, buy, buy Adidas sneakers and say, wife, we are jogging from four to five. <laughs> then there's no submission in her. If she refuses, if she refuses your godly right to make her beautiful, then there's no submission. There's no submission. So we get together. You see now, I'm starting to think you are the Zanu side. <laughs> I don't, you've got a very cage spirit here. The other side was just quiet. Okay? Because what, look, what God is ultimately aiming for is be happy with each other. And if you don't take time to shape each other to what makes you happy, you will keep looking at what others are doing as if they are doing a miracle. They are not. They are doing the same things that others are doing. Are you with me? And, 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 and look, beloved, beloved, please. It's important that you are happy in your marriage. It's important. What do I mean by that? 
please don't marry to, for us. Marry for you. Because now, this is the challenge we've got. You want your wife to look like what the church wants. But wives don't vow to the church. They vow to husbands. This is why what we do as men, you tell this wife, no long hair, no nails, devilish. You go to the hotel with a girl with long nails, long hair, and it's pleasurable. Because you denied yourself a biblically given right in order to suit a community. Now you are stuck with a wife that doesn't please you. But as long as you look like a good Adventist. Yes, but you are the married one. This marriage must ultimately work for you. So, from suitability, yeah, Paul has now given us content, not application, content of this suitability, love and submission. But notice again, Paul respects God. He has not defined the activities of the home because God left it at suitable. Paul leaves it at suitable. He simply says, this suitability, when you struggle to know how to understand it, look at Christ and the church. You will see there what this suitability is about. Scenario you will find in 1 Kings chapter 4. Because we don't have time, I'll just mention them and you'll note them. Uh, <laughs> No, 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 we are heading to six. I don't want to exhaust the saints. I, I'd like to finish while you still want to listen. Okay? So, first Kings, uh, first Kings chapter four, there's a lady. Her husband has died, leaving them in debt. Are you with me? The Bible says he died, leaving the family in. She goes to Elisha and says, my husband, a prophet of the Lord, is dead. And he left me in debt. And now the debt collector is coming to take my sons as a payment for the debt. What do you see in that scenario? You see the word of God condemning financial secrecy. He never involved her. I keep warning you. Some of you think you own the house. Have you seen the title deed? Because death is coming. And if you don't plan together, one of you will be very surprised the day one dies. Plan financially together before you become a widow looking for oil. Because death is coming. And believe you me, one will wish they were dead as well when they are now going through things. If there is one challenge in Africa, it's financial secrecy in marriages. People don't want to open up and say, this is how much we have. This is how we are going to plan. When we are talking about financial planning, we can even agree on blind spots. Are you with me? For example, I say to my wife, look, you've got friends. Friends who may borrow money from you. Some of them may feel embarrassed. And truth be told, they wouldn't want me to know. Are you with me? It's okay. Protect your friendships. Let's agree. How much can operate in this home without us freffing so that I give you room. Yes. 
Where are they going? Why are they leaving when we are busy worshipping? <laughs> it's the spirit that told me to block them. <laughs> he knew they don't want to listen. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. So, so, now we have this widow. Guys, please go read that story again. It is painful. This lady knew nothing about the financial going on. Can you imagine... You are grieving your spouse today. You are burying them on Sunday. On Monday, you have visitors that say, we, we just wanted to know, now that your spouse is no more, how will you be paying the rent? That time, all you know is we own this house. Guys, please. Let us be fair to one another. Don't plunge your spouse into humiliation when you die. Speak openly about finances. Openly. And like I'm saying, we can agree on blind spots. Do you understand? You know what? On our budget, let's allocate 5,000 rands every month. Whatever you play with there, I'm not interested. It's for you to help a friend, you know, if they are in trouble and you don't want to be embarrassed or you are helping a relative, small things, okay, you, you can go do that with your friends. I'm not going to be all over about what happened. But let's be on the same plan about what is happening here. What do we own? What do we not? What do we owe? How much do we owe? What is there for what? Beloved, 13 years in the ministry, nothing has been painful like consoling widows and widowers twice for the death and the surprises. Because now you are done with the funeral and this man calls you and this woman calls you and says, I need to see you. I'm falling apart. Why? Well, now that I've been going through things, I discovered this, I discovered that. I discovered this, I discovered that. <coughs> I don't know maybe if it happens here. In my home country, it's worse. These are ladies that were driving Porsche Panameras. They had to lose it all and go back to work because they were never told how the Panamera is paid for. Then when he died, someone came and said, sorry, ma'am, it's our car. It was on a long list plan. But when you were given the car, they were ribbons. <laughs> Happy birthday, my wife. <laughs> huh? You even changed friends because the Panamera doesn't go to rural areas. Now, let's address a real concern. Somewhere, not here, not here. It's not in your minds. It's me just coming up with a hypothesis, but it's not here. Somewhere out there, there is someone who might say, but I don't trust my spouse financially. They have not demonstrated a mind that can be trusted. Look, there are some own goals there. You chose each other. You failing to do your homework. Ah, what can we say? You had enough time to date, to discuss money. You had enough time to think about how you want to use money. You didn't. You are in now. Are you with me? The only step now is to seek help for both of you, psychologists, therapists, money specialists, to say, here we are. We are married. We want to build and live a legacy, but we are not of the same mind about money. I think we should invest, 
save, spend. He thinks spend, spend, spend. Okay? Let's sit down now with a professional. Help us break out. You know, part of the reason people like Elder Charter are here is exactly for that. To say we can rehabilitate our family finances. But there's got to be willingness. You know, because honestly, you know in some funerals you can see that the way the, the people are crying is like they are saying, wake up. <laughs> wake up so I kill you again myself. Because I now know what you've been hiding. Wake up, I kill you. We bury you again. Please, we must encourage such homes. Let me give you a second scenario. In the second scenario, also in Kings, we read about the Shulamite lady. Do you remember the lady? That built a house for the prophet. Read the text very carefully. The, 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 the writing is clear. She has the means. But notice how she honors her husband. She doesn't build the prophet a house. She goes to her husband and says, I think we should build the man of God a room. There is a myth that when a woman has money, submission goes out the door. Fallacy. A man can lose his job and still be respected. If you can't do it, there is something faulty in your biblical training. The Shulamite, even, even when Elisha sends Gehaz, he says, go ask her, what can we do for them? You must listen to her answer. I live among my own people. Yeah? She clearly demonstrates the financial stability coming from her side of the family. But at no point does she disrespect him. Yeah? She speaks in a we to make decisions. Let us build the man of God a room. So the idea that when one has money and the other doesn't, we can't be suitable is false. We may differ in financial exposure and still run a happy home. The key is suitability. Now let me come to a part that might be sensitive. It's important to negotiate and talk suitability. For example, let's just think about it without being emotional. If I am married to her and I lose my job, and she is an electrical engineer, and from time to time, she has to be called because, uh, is it Zesco? Zesa. Things have collapsed and the grid is dark. If she calls me from work saying, my husband, we have just been deployed to Mtari, power station down. It's not fair for me to ask, so who will cook? No, no, no. Let's just pause and listen carefully. Honestly, are you saying she must now drive, fix a power station, return, find you with the kids, waiting for her to cook? Guys, you don't need to be Christian to know that's just not fair. You don't need to be Christian. Common decency tells you my wife is not available for domestic duties. She's making money for us. Let me take the domestic duties and lighten the load. Now, when we say this, we are treated like we are emasculating men. Come on. 
It's, it's just pure decency. You can't make someone bear all the weight. It's common decency. Yeah? When you come home, find a clean house. It's common decency. Because I'm here. But guess what? It's not just about being unemployed. These days, careers are changing. You know, I have a friend. Very intelligent guy. He studied all very big, complicated things in IT. Okay? He studied very complex things with big mathematical equations. He works from home. Are you with me? But from home, he monitors the systems of Fuji, Japan. That guy has not been to an office in over 10 years. Occasionally, he flies to Japan. But otherwise, he works from home. Are you with me? He's a Shona man from here. When I visit him, he'll say, Pastor, uh, let's go to the shops. I need to grab some veggies uh, to prepare the meal. Because his wife works eight to five. He works for the Japanese. They are our sleep when we are awake. So he gets to do the things that the wife is unable to do. When she comes home, he has taken the house and the kids to a particular distance with homework and everything. Then he sleeps because he needs to wake up when the Japanese wake up. Doesn't make him less of a man. It's decency because it's about suitability. You know, when you're a preacher, you know, camp meetings you'll never come back to. <laughs> yeah? So that now you must pour everything knowing you are not coming back. <laughs> let's do the last scenario and then we talk. The last scenario, let's go together. Proverbs 31. I want to demonstrate something there. So difficult. I'm holding the mic. Please, can you Proverbs 31 for me, Elder? Yeah. You can, please, can you read it for me? Okay. There are verses I'll stop you when you get to because they are my main focus. Can you just listen? The words of King Lam Lamiel, the utterances which his mother taught him. What, my son, and what, son of my womb, and what, son of my vows, do not give your strength to women. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I, you're not hearing. Okay. Uh, know your ways. <laughs> know your ways to that which destroys kings. It is not for kings, Olamel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor the princesses intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law and per pervert the justice of all the afflicted. Uh, why not? Okay. Uh, you want the virtuous woman? Yeah. Okay. So verse 10. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her. So he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservants. She considers a field and Let's buys stop it. Stop there. 
What you've just been told is she is wife, boss, mother. Did you notice she has servants? Huh? You noticed that? Okay, continue. Awesome. <laughs> continue, I think. Uh, okay. You can start from there, it's fine. She is like the merchant ships, and she brings her food from afar. She also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maid servants. She considers a field and buys it. For her profits, she plants a vineyard. Pause. She girds. Okay. Pause. She buys. She buys. With her what? With her what? The problem with this story has been re read and spiritualized. These are not spiritual characteristics. This is an industrious, productive woman. She has a husband, a mother. She has a husband, so she's a wife. She has a mother. She runs industry. Follow very carefully. She considers a field and buys it. From her profit, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good and her lamb does not go out by night. She stretches out her hands to the uh, distaff and her hand holds the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor. She, her, yes, she reaches out her hands to the needy. She's Pause. not... Okay. She is kind. She's kind. Poverty, she can see and addresses it. Where she sees need, she shows up. Please continue. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. She makes tempestry for herself. Her clothing is, far, is linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. Stop. She makes linen garments. Pause. <laughs> Now, that part is critical, very critical. The olden cities of the Middle East look nothing like our cities. You see, the gate of the city is where men came together to do business and judgment for the city. So, what the text is saying is, she is married. The gate of the city was not for common men. The gate of the city was for the powerful men of that city. Are you with me? That is why when Absalom was rebelling against David, what did he do? Do you remember that story? What did he do? Yes, Elder, you've just said it. He stopped by the gate. He went to sit by the gate because the gate is where the king judges. When he realizes the king is absent, he sat in the king's position because the gate is where power is distributed. In other words, the story is saying, this lady is married to a very powerful man in the city. A man who sits at the gate to determine the economy of the land. Listen very carefully. At the gate, the man decide the price of land, the price of vegetables, the price of exports. At the gate, the men sit with the scales. They decide the price of gold, the price of silver. Now look at what is happening between them. Women don't sit at the gate. They are not allowed. Men sit at the gate. So there is this guy. He sits at the gate, controls the economy of the city, comes home, tells the wife where to invest because he has made a decision about it at the gate. Suitability. 
He goes to the gate to pave the way for her businesses. Ah, I don't know if you are hearing me. He is sitting at the gate. Huh? He makes decisions. Comes home and says, buy land. Something's going to happen. Buy land. Plant potatoes. Because at the gate, they were made to understand that there's a potato shortage. In other words, this guy borrows his wife, or rather lends his wife, his power. And she takes that power and converts it to the family economy. He sits where she can't. She sits where he can't. He has to be at the gate influencing decisions. He can't be in the farm. So she is in the farm. Receiving the outcome. Something that you were saying. He doesn't block her. He uses his power for her to prosper. Because when she prospers, the family is prospering. Suitability. <coughs> Suitability. Don't run around telling us women mustn't work, women must stay at home. If it's suitable for your family, we agree. Do it. But if it is suitable for this family, for her to own land, they are doing it. It's all about suitability. Don't convert your family view to a world view. In the Bible, you see women who are empowered. And as I've shown you, you see one who was cut off. You see one who was rich yet respectful. You see another working hand in hand with her husband. And they are winning together. They are a team. Stability is the issue. Even when it comes to children, wherever we are, make your family suitable. God bless you. Amen. Let's talk. Oh, okay. I talk first. Please. I've got the mic. Okay. <laughs> you know, Pastor, um, I just want a quick reply. Yeah. I don't, I'm not yet for debate. Okay. When Eve, when, shall we say, when the first couple sinned, yes. God did not go to the wife. Yes. He went to Adam. Yes. Where are you? Yes. And he had an answer. Yes. On punishment, yes. we see the, Adam says, you gave me this wife. Wife is punished. The husband is punished more severely. Are you with me? Yes, In my own I'm opinion, he was punished you. more severely. Okay. Take for instance, Jesus and two other guys visits Abraham and Sarah. And he says, um, Sarah, quickly cook this food. It, it, what is an order? I like the way my Bible puts it. Quickly put, make this, this food here. And so it, it, yes, I know what Paul said and what have you, but we can see from the Old Testament that ladies were assigned to cook. No. Oh, well, uh, no. I, I can quote some more verses. I, I, no. Okay. You are, you are allowed to quote, but what I will not permit you to do is interpret improperly. Quote you can. Well, interpretation then varies now. From yes. one to the other. Just like you interpret heart surgery, I interpret the scriptures. <laughs> okay? And also, we must never make the Old and New Testament look like enemies to each other. You see, that point you made, I hear what Paul says, what have you, but the Old Testament, that's not proper biblical exegesis. We never raise a standard of another text over the other for our argument. We must read them in their full context of what God is addressing. Let's talk. Um, my question, I've got two questions, especially when you were starting. The issue of suitability, because you have said the word of God is to be supreme. 
I think you are then, if you are a converted Christian who doesn't want problems, the issue of an equal yoking comes into play. Yes. I might like like Sam, Samson, but the parents said, how do you go to the Philistines? <laughs> so I think she might have all these other aspects. But for as long as um, she is not a believer, <sighs> yes, it will cause a lot of problems. Yes. And I think at the end of the day, you have negative energy now where you are praying certain things that you could have avoided by making the right decision. Absolutely. And then coming back to Dr. Chimuka's um, um, question, in Genesis 3, 16, there are certain things that because you are a man, God pronounced them. You love your husband. You rule over you. And that punishment was good because yeah, because God didn't yes. punish them in anger. You are saying now you need to come back and this is what you do. Yes. So I will bear children. And because I've born them, there is a time, even Spirit of Prophecy says, it is the duty of the mother. Because the first school is what? At home. Yes. And we see Jacob actually doing it. The few two, three years he had Moses. Moses was instilled biblical principles because we have power. And I think that influence now as a Christian, because at the end of the day, we want to uh, parent for heaven. So I Absolutely. think what those things, God pronounced them. And when you are breastfeeding, you are already teaching a child you temperance. You are influencing them and all that. And I think that one, the issue of unequal yoking, whether you are suitable or you think you are compatible, how can two work together when they have not agreed? Well, remember, once you are unequally yoked, you are already unsuitable. But I'm saying now... Yeah. So one cannot claim suitability when they can tell we are unequally yoked. Because yeah. already you are bringing disaster upon yourself. Now, I, I know couples, for example, who, specifically people who married outside of their faith. Okay? What, I, I know a few whom I will say they are making it work. Not necessarily that they are flying. They are making it work. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. It is ideal to pursue suitability at all levels, spiritually and otherwise, so that you don't have challenges after. Any other hand? Come on, start there, and then I'm going to go there. It's the timing. It's the timing. You need to go to supper now. <laughs> so I just wanted... But we have one more slot tomorrow, I think. Okay, yeah, so I was going to ask about... There's one more tomorrow, okay. ...suitability in the context of in-laws. Sometimes okay. you feel you're suitable, but, you know, in-laws can work against suitability. Okay, we'll look at that tomorrow. We'll look at that. We have to start with the in-laws before we answer you. Yes, ma'am. to talk about um, Sarah and Abraham, why Abraham didn't go and cook, because he was entertaining visitors, and he had trained his wife. Yes, he was, and he had servants, because Sarah wouldn't go and kill a cow, would, he, would she? So, if you read, actually you'll understand, if, even the spirit of prophets, that Sarah, they had servants, and those servants were the ones that were helping them do those things. Sarah wasn't going to cook everything. Or Abraham, was he going to leave the visitors and go and cook? Okay. So that's okay. what I wanted to say. There's a hand behind you, then we, we close in prayer. Um, Fundis, I just wanted to raise the issue of uh, unsuitability. Yes. It always seems to come up or raise this ugly head a little later after you have enjoyed what you thought was a... Uh, Equally okay. Yes, yes. True. Le? Ufuna le? I am a father to three boys. You must exercise some patience. Um, oh, okay. Last one. Okay. Yeah, the timekeepers are very serious. So. 
Yes. Pastor, I think yeah. I, I like your 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 the way you put across the issue of uh, of being fair financially, so yes. that both parties know where we are coming from as a family yes. financially, and uh, both parties know where we are going to. Yes. Uh, the issue of uh, things coming out after death, and I think that's that's very wrong. But I also want to submit that. Um, the Bible says in verse 25 of chapter 5, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, and gave himself for her. And so as it continues down, it says you should sanctify, you should cleanse, you should provide as Christ provides for the church. I think you have a role to be out hunting to provide for the family. Absolutely. And the times that decisions that are made when we're out hunting. And I don't have to come back home. When I'm out hunting, I say, I've seen an elephant, how do I kill it and how do I bring it? I go out and hunt and provide for the family. And when I come back home, I make, <laughs> I make sure that the home is happy. The wife knows where the tigers of the house are. And the general appreciation of the family finances should be given. But there are tricks and tricks. Okay, that's Amen. deep shown. There's yeah. things that we do when we go out working there. Mm -hmm. And we're working, and, and those things, I've told my wife, baby, there's certain things I will not tell you when I'm at work. Yeah. There's certain projects you will discover after they're two, three months old. And when I they are now stable, and I can hand them over to the family for management and for you to one my finances. I'll hand them over. Because I'm an entrepreneur. She is not. She is scared to go where I'll go. And if I come home and say, baby, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to like, yo, what are you doing there? You know, send seven hours like leave that stuff. But there are times when I say, okay, my wife, I'll 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 leave that stuff. And I come back six months down and I said, baby, remember that project is doing fine. Look at this man that we're making from that project. You told a holy lie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because ultimately you ran with it and it's been successful. Yes. We are coming back to be honest. Yes. Okay. And the time the project fails, you know, then you have the right to tell or not to tell. But this is... <laughs> <laughs> Be, be, because, because I am the head and I'm supposed to provide for this family. Yes. When things have gone bad, she has the right to say, innocent, you've messed us up. Yes. So I have that responsibility to run with things. And the general direction, she would know. The general finances, she would know. But there are things that we do as yes. men. And there is room. And she, and, and she should know. Ne room ya baba the, the things that they do out there as boys. When I strike a deal with Tanaka, and before it's ripe and red, I could strike a deal. Tanaka, let's do one or two things. What do you think? And we polish it and we work on it. And when it's ripe and we think we can present it to the family, because we can't, once we're chasing an elephant, we can't be updating them how we're chasing an elephant. No. When we kill it, we yes. then bring it home. Yes. I, I, what, what you have said, <laughs> what you have said, has no contradiction with what I'm presenting. Yes, I just want to yes because I agree. Everything is pinned by the principle of honesty. Because you are saying to me, even if I did make a loss, I'll still come back and be able to say, you know, I did that thing. And because here's what is important as well. Because you made an example with Cecilinda, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. As much as she may not be an entrepreneur, that is where it is good because her opinions might show you blind spots you wouldn't have seen. So it's good to come and say, maybe not say I am doing, maybe you just want to, you know, and say, this project, how would you view it? Now, when she tells you what she sees, it may not necessarily be meaning don't do it, but she's armed you. She's armed you. You can now go into it better because she showed you blind spots. I'm not giving you any more. I'm going to get killed there. Okay. Look at this pussy. She's... 
Uh-uh. Shall we pray? <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you because we are able to study our families in an environment where we can laugh. The truth is, dear Jesus, there are so many families where they can't even joke in a church. Thank you for blessing us with this gift. I've traveled many churches, denominations, but I always marvel at the way as Adventists you've given us platforms to help strengthen our lives. Thank you for that. I pray that the families represented here may never give up on finding their suitability. That daily we wake up, sometimes we will err, sometimes we will do well, but Lord, keep us seeking this suitability so that when you come in your clouds of glory, we can proudly say, here's the wife you gave me. Here's the husband you gave me. Here are the children you gave me. I presented them to you knowing I followed your word and your teaching. And Lord, I do know that all families represented here are facing some form of challenge in one way or another. Some it's finances, some the finances are fine, but it's communication. Others, the finance, the communication is fine, but it's sexuality. Others, it's in-laws. Others, it's this or that. Lord Jesus, you have power. You have power to address all of this. But sometimes... We are either too arrogant to admit we need help or we are too scared we don't want to look fragile. But Lord, I pray, whatever challenges we are facing in our families, can your spirit please humble us so that when you come to give us help, we are ready to receive. In a special way, I want to take this moment and pray for every pastoral family in Zimbabwe. Protect your servants. Protect their homes. In a difficult economic environment, Lord, some may even be giving up, feeling like to accept your call was to accept suffering. Lord, do not permit that the families of your anointed be examples of casualty. Come into those homes, Holy Spirit. Help your servants to find their footing. I want to pray for the families of the elders who lead our churches. Lord, to be an elder comes with no salary. Yet these men and women have agreed to be families that will lead your church. Now, Lord, I ask, sanctify them. Improve them. Do not permit their mistakes and errors to be a point of humiliation, not only for themselves, but even for the churches they are leading. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us a chance to not only learn from your word, but to speak to you. Now, dismiss us in peace as we continue with other programs of the day. And may your Holy Spirit tabernacle in all our homes. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.